Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the nations rage? And the people imagine a vain thing, a thing of naught, a worthless waste of time. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, Christos in the Greek, Christ that is to say, and make a note of Acts chapter 4, verses 24 through 30 to see how this corresponds with Christ's first advent, as well as the Acts of the Apostles, but also this looks forward to Christ. Christ's second advent and his return at the seventh trumpet. So the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and notice nations, people, kings, and rulers in these first two verses, four being the number of earth, against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us, looking forward ultimately to the battle of the Valley of Haman Gog and the battle of Armageddon, which happen at the end of the hour of temptation. They happen at the same same time when the true Christ returns when the seventh angel sounds and he comes to rule the earth with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God as it's written in Revelation chapter 19. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision with those hailstones written of in the seventh vial in Revelation 16. That's where it says great Babylon, which means confusion, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So that fixes the time frame here, the return of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every Every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. At both battles, the battle of Armageddon, which happens over where Satan will have appeared as the false Christ whenever the true Christ returns, the battle of Armageddon ending Satan's religious system, while the battle of the Valley of Haman Gog ends the political, the communistic atheism brought about by Satan through Esau. Satan's role of Antichrist and his global government being destroyed at that time, as well as his fallen angels, with all flesh being done away with at that time. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Remember, Christ treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God upon his return at the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, and immediately after that silence in heaven about the space of half an hour written of in the seventh seal. So in other words, the true Christ returns at 777. That's after the false Christ appears in Jerusalem, who is Satan at 666. Christ will destroy Satan's role of Antichrist with the brightness of his coming as it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Christ's feet will touch down upon the Mount of Olives as we know from Zechariah chapter 14. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Christ Jesus being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and he glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son. Today have I begotten thee, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 5, both King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, the nations, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Christ being the rock, the true rock, that smites the image written of in Daniel chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar saw. That image being symbolic of Satan's one world system. Christ will smite it on the feet, as it's written in Daniel chapter 2, that were of iron and potter's clay, meaning it's a system made up of Satan and his angels, the Kenites, as well as the lion and the bear, many having come out of Babylon by that point because of what God will say through his election. And listen to the next verse, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, because it's at that time that the true Christ, the true rock, that stone that smites the image of Daniel chapter 2 returns, and that's when the iron, clay, brass, silver, and gold are broken into pieces together, destroyed upon the return of the true Christ, and they become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Remember the chaff written of in Psalm 1? The stone that smote the image, which is the true rock, the true Christ, became a great mountain, a great 
kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, that is to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this great mountain, this great kingdom, the kingdom of God filled the whole earth with the millennium, the thousand years beginning at that time with Satan being locked up in the bottomless pit until the thousand years are finished. That's when discipline will be taught by Christ through his election, the Zadok, as well as the other Levites, whereby as many as possible will stand against Satan after the thousand years are finished and go into the eternity as opposed to being blotted out in the lake of fire. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed by God through his word, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, love the Lord, in other words, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way in the lake of fire after the thousand years are finished. That's what happens to those who choose to follow Satan instead of Christ at that time. They're blotted out of existence forever and ever. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him, because in doing so they won't perish at the great white throne judgment, but they'll go into the eternity, the third world age. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is the true Christ. So again, we see the seventh trumpet sounds, and the true Christ returns. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. Christ Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that sharp sword which is the word of God that cuts both ways, that with it he should smite the nations, and he is that rock that's spoken of in Daniel chapter 2 that destroys Satan's one world system. As we're about to read in this chapter in verse 20, Satan's one world system as well as his role of antichrist will be destroyed forever and ever. And that's what that statue is symbolic of in Daniel chapter 2. The stone in Daniel chapter 2 symbolic of the true Christ upon his return when he destroys Satan's one world system as well as his role of antichrist. And that's when Babylon, that is to say confusion, is destroyed because all are changed into spiritual bodies at that time. That's when they'll understand the reality of the situation and that they've been worshiping Satan, thinking that he was Jesus, and they'll want to die at that time. They'll want the rocks and mountains to fall on them and cover them, to hide them from Jesus, out of shame. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Again, this purges that wine of fornication from those that were deceived by the Antichrist. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So here we see the true Christ, not the false Christ that we saw in the 13th chapter and the 6th chapter. We saw Satan on a white horse pretending to be Christ, but he wasn't. He only had one crown. The true Christ has many crowns. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. He was trying to pass himself off as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he spake as a dragon. It was the false Christ sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be God, the son of perdition, that man of sin, Satan himself claiming to be Jesus. But here we see the true Christ returning and destroying Satan's role of Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. Because again, all are changed into spiritual bodies. They're going to realize at that time that the one they thought was Christ is actually the devil and the true Christ is now returning. That's how he returns as a thief because they won't be expecting that at all. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great, because all are changed into spiritual bodies at that time. There will be a bunch of corpses everywhere. 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, on the white horse, and against his army, the armies of heaven, that is to say. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Again, these aren't two individuals. This is simply Satan's role of Antichrist and his one world system being destroyed at that time. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This remnant being made up of flesh men, Satan's angels being part of that one world system, because that's what Daniel's fourth beast is. It's supernatural. Only Satan survives this, but the ten horns, the four angels from the Euphrates, as well as the 7,000, the locust army we read of back in chapter 9, they're all destroyed at that time at the seventh trumpet. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. This has to do with Edom, that red nation, Esau, not the Christians of Russia or the other communistic countries or the countries that Esau forms an alliance with, as we'll read of in chapter 38, but the communistic anti-Christian system. So this concerns Mount Seir, the Mount of Esau, who was Jacob's twin brother. And whenever they were yet in their mother's womb, they fought together. And God told their mother that two nations are in your womb and the elder shall serve the younger. And you can read the rest in Genesis chapters 25 through 27 gives you the foundation of Jacob and Esau, but it really goes back to the first world age because God hated Esau when he was yet in the womb. Let you know what Esau did during Satan's rebellion and whose side he was on. So chapter 35 here concerns Esau, so it's no mystery that Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal that we'll read of in Ezekiel 38, is referring to Esau, that communistic, atheistic system. Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it, and say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. They're going to know that God exists whenever he rains down those hailstones on Gog and his multitude in the Battle of the Valley of Haman Gog, which means the Battle of the Valley of the Multitude of Gog. Esau will be destroyed from being a nation forever, as well as his alliance, as well as his confederacy, all nations really being destroyed at that time, and Christ setting up his kingdom at the seventh trumpet. That's when that happens, at the end of the five-month-long hour of temptation. Esau will be destroyed from being a nation forever, as we can also read in the book of Obadiah. Verse 4, I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, not Satan, and not a communistic atheistic system. As far as a communistic system is concerned, they worship the state. The state is their god, even though it's atheistic, but it's still religious because the religion of atheism is to believe that there's not a god. It's a strict policy as far as atheism is concerned. And the two wings of the communistic system have spread abroad globally in the forms of Stalinism and Trotskyism, which I believe are symbolized by Ammon and Moab, as you can see in Amos chapters 1 and 2. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end, and remember Esau was cursed to always live by his sword and and look at their symbol, the hammer and the sickle, communism, and this time of the calamity of the children of Israel. You could even look at the 1945 occupation of Berlin and see a type there as well, a type that plays into the actuality of the five-month-long hour of temptation. It was because of World War II that the United Nations was founded and this final generation began, the generation of the fig tree, directly a result of the Second World War. Therefore, as I live, 
saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. And again, Edom means red. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, it's going to be destroyed, and cut off from it him that passeth out, and him that returneth. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men, in thy hills, and in thy valleys, and in all the rivers shall they fall that are slain, with the sword, with the sword that comes out of the mouth of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet when all are changed into spiritual bodies. There's going to be dead corpses everywhere. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, as opposed to Satan or anybody or anything that is worshipped. In the case of the communists, they really worship themselves in what's called secular humanism. Because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that's the point, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel." The nations of Israel, the nations that the tribes were scattered to, that later formed the Christian nations. That's who Esau is going to attack, as we'll cover in chapter 38. But they're going to be stopped by God with those hailstones that rain down out of heaven. These are gigantic hailstones, and at that time, again, as we know from 1 Corinthians 15, all will be changed into spiritual bodies. So again, God says to Esau, I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Again, think about 1945, look into it if you're not familiar with the history. That was just a type of what is yet to come. Thus with your mouth ye have boasted against me, and have multiplied your words against me, I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. So this is a global thing being spoken of here in the futurist sense. Not historical, not ultimately, as thou didst rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Idumea, that's Edom, letting you know exactly who he's talking about, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. For once and for all, they're going to know that God exists. And it's at the time that they all die, as well as everybody else. But they'll be pelted with those hailstones, great hailstones, fire and brimstone, as it's written in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 22. And whenever you see this word desolate, it looks forward to the time of the desolator, whose fault it was in the first place. This whole communistic atheism thing, obviously that Satan behind it, the Kenites, his own children, orchestrated the Bolshevik Revolution. I think that's obvious. They're murderers, being the children of Cain, who was the first murderer. And when Satan appears, most of the world will think that he's Jesus returned. And at the end of that five-month-long hour of temptation, in the Battle of the Valley of Hamangog, Esau shall be destroyed from being a nation forever. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. These two twins in the womb of Rebekah would go on to be the two superpowers, Russia, that red nation, the communistic atheism, not the Christians of Russia, but the communistic system, and the United States, the other superpower, the Christian nations, that is to say, with the United States as the leader thereof. So that animosity between the Christian nations and Russia goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 25, the two nations that fought together in the womb of Rebekah. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, Behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment. And again, he would go on to form that red nation, Russia, of today. 
In chapter 27, we'll learn that Esau will be cursed to always live away from the fat of the land, and Jacob will be blessed to always have plenty of everything, the blessings of God, in accordance with Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Christian nations of today came from Jacob, the communistic came from Esau, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, which means heel grabber. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, which means red, that red nation. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? Thinking after the flesh, as communistic atheists always do. The system, not the Christians of Russia, understand. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Fulfilling the prophecy, the elder shall serve the younger. And as it's written in the book of Malachi, God loved Jacob, but Esau he hated. Ezekiel chapter 38, with the word of wisdom from our Father, in Jesus' name, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now there's several ways right here coming out the gate to identify who this is speaking of. For one thing, in the Septuagint, in Numbers 24, instead of Agag, it says Gog there, and Agag was was the king of the Amalekites, who was Esau's grandson. Esau, who became Edom, which means red, that red nation, Jacob's brother. And from Genesis chapter 25, we know that when Jacob and Esau were yet in the womb, they struggled together, and God told their mother, Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. In Genesis 27, we see that Esau was cursed to always live away from the fat of the land. That's in the northern hemisphere, Russia of today. The communistic atheistic system, not the Christians of Russia. So Gog, the land of Magog, and look at an ancient map as far as the land of Magog is concerned, the chief, that's Rosh in the Hebrew, which may point to Russia, Bullinger notes in the Companion Bible, but us having looked back at the 20th century and the events of the early 21st century know for a fact that it's speaking of Russia, that red nation, becoming the USSR in the early 20th century. But Bullinger, who edited the Companion Bible, died in 1913, before the First World War even transpired, or the Bolshevik Revolution, which is when the USSR came in to being. So the 12 tribes of Edom went north, becoming the USSR in the early 20th century, now known as the Russian Federation, and will become the bear of Daniel chapter 7, with Jacob, Esau's brother, the Christian nations, becoming the lion of Daniel 7 at the woe of the fifth trumpet. They're not the bear or the lion yet. It's only at the woe of the fifth trumpet that that one world political system emerges, along with the Kenites becoming the leopard. Previous to that, they were the he-goat, as we know from Daniel chapter 8. But at the woe of the fifth trumpet, when that first beast of Revelation 13 emerges, they're the leopard providing the infrastructure, the four hidden dynasties of the one world system. And Daniel's fourth beast is the fourth beast written of in Daniel chapter 7, and that's the supernatural, the one with the ten horns, Satan and his angels, that locust army. This one world political system will receive a deadly wound, after which Satan shall appear as Antichrist, and at at the end of the five-month-long hour of temptation, the Battle of Armageddon will take place in the original land of Israel, as you can read of in Revelation 19, with this Battle of the Valley of Hamangog that we're going to read of in Ezekiel 38 happening at the exact same time in Alaska. Why do I say that? Isn't it common sense? Look at a map. If you were the Russians, how would you attack America? Don't you think it's common sense that they would come over through Alaska? I think that's pretty obvious. So two different battles, Armageddon, Armageddon and Hamangog in two different geographical locations, 
but they happen at the same time, and both are fought by God when he destroys Satan's role of Antichrist and his one world system, and destroying Esau, Edom, that red nation, from being a nation forever. No more communistic atheism ever again. As it's written in Daniel 7, the rest of the beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, have their dominion taken away. No more one world system, because Christ's kingdom will be set up at the seventh trumpet upon his return, but their lives, their souls, that is to say, are prolonged for a season and a time. The time is the millennium, and that season is when Satan is let loose for a short season, and whoever follows him then is blotted out in the lake of fire. Everybody else goes into the eternity, the third world age. So we're speaking of the bear here, with Esau at the head of it, Edom, that red nation, along with those that align themselves with him. Remember, Esau married one of the daughters of Ishmael, so you have to go back to Genesis to fully understand what's being spoken of here. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince, that's Rosh, of Meshach and Tubal. And again, Bullinger, having died in 1913, did another work, which I don't 100% agree with, but look at this. He identifies Meshach and Tubal as Moscow and Tobolsk, the two capitals of Russia. Having died in 1913, why would he say that? And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, that's Iran of today, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. And Ethiopia and Libya, you'll notice mentioned in Daniel 11, as well as Edom, Ammon and Moab, Ammon and Moab being the two wings of the communistic system. And you can document that in Amos chapters 1 and 2. Moab burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. That's speaking of the Bolshevik revolution, obviously. And that's when the Soviet Union came into being. Many would argue that they're no longer communist but look at their Duma. That's their parliament building. There's a hammer and a sickle on their parliament building. And in their V-Day marches, again, hammer and sickle, a picture's worth a thousand words. So Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, which is Turkey of today, and all his bands, look at the formulation of this going on right now between Russia and Turkey. It's been in the news heavily. The house of Tagorma, which is Armenia, of the North Quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee, with the Oriental communistic nations as well, no doubt. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. This is happening now, the formulation of Ezekiel 38, with this battle not transpiring until the end of of the five-month-long hour of temptation on the same day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns at the seventh trumpet. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Some people call it the melting pot. All nations in one country against the mountains of Israel. Remember we talked about this earlier. The nations of Israel, the Christian nations, specifically the United States of America, which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them. Manasseh prophetically, and if you're familiar with E. Raymond Capp's work, The Abrahamic Covenant, if you subtract 2,520 years from 1776, you get the date in which Manasseh was taken captive by the Assyrian. 2,520 being the seven times written of, 360 being a time, times seven, 2,520. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, read The Abrahamic Covenant by E. Raymond Capp. I don't agree with him 100% on everything either, but you'd be pretty dense to think what I just said was a coincidence. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, speaking to Gog here, Esau, Edom, who was Jacob's brother. They fought together in the womb, and God said, Two nations are in your womb, and the elder shall serve the younger. God said to Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. And God later, through Isaac, in Genesis chapter 27, cursed Esau to always live away from the fat of the land. And he also said, By your sword shall you live, that hammer and sickle, the communistic atheist 
socialistic system of Esau, who never cared about his heritage. That's why he got the name Edom, because he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of red pottage. Therefore, his name is called Edom, which means red, that red nation, the communistic atheistic system, not the Christians of Russia or any of these other countries, but the system. And if you go read through Genesis, count how many times Esau so much as mentions God's name, and there you'll have it. Atheistic communism dating all the way back to the book of Genesis with Esau, Jacob's brother. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm against the mountains of Israel. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Which includes Red China, which was created by the Soviet Union, and the Islamic nations, because remember, Esau married one of the daughters of Ishmael. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And again, this doesn't happen until the end of the five-month-long hour of temptation. Satan will be here at that time as Antichrist, and that's where this evil thought comes from. You might read what happens during the sixth vial, as far as this is concerned, in Revelation chapter 16. That concerns the events that lead up to the Battle of Armageddon, over where Jerusalem is in that geographic location round about it. And what we're reading of here concerns the Battle of the Valley of Hamangog. And this is the same time at the end of the five-month-long hour of temptation that those hailstones come into it. And those hailstones are also described in Revelation 16 as well in the seventh vial, which is when the true Christ returns in both Armageddon, and we read of that in Ezekiel 13 as far as the hailstones in Jerusalem, and this Battle of the Valley of Hamangog hailstones in both geographic locations, two different battles that happen at the same time on the day that the true Christ returns, three and a half days after the two witnesses are murdered by Satan in Jerusalem. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates. So this isn't the Middle East being spoken of here, this is America. To take a a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations being formed by those of the original house of Israel and those grafted in of all races because all are one in Christ Jesus if you're a Christian then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise and all are one in Christ Jesus which have gotten cattle and goods the blessings of Jacob that dwell in the midst of the land she and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee art thou come to take a spoil hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey to carry away silver and gold to take away cattle and goods and to take a great spoil and remember we read of Tarshish back in chapter 27 of this book of Ezekiel when we read of Tyrus which means rock not the true rock but the false rock and in the 27th chapter of this book of Ezekiel we have the detailed schematic of Satan's one world system with Tarshish and it says Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches with silver, iron, lead and tin they traded in thy fairs Javan, Tubal and Meshach that's Tobolsk and Moscow we just read of that in Ezekiel 38 were thy merchants they traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market they of the house of Tagorma Armenia traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules the men of Dedan were thy merchants many isles were the merchandise of thine hand they brought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony and there's Syria in the next verse and if you skip to verse 20 there's Dedan was thy merchant in precious clothes for chariots so there it all is laid out for you therefore son of man prophesy and say unto Gog thus saith the Lord God in that day when when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land. It's God causing this to happen to make a point. 
that the heathen may know me, the nations, that is to say, those who aren't Christian, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And this is even written of all the way back in Genesis 27 with that curse placed on Esau that whenever he fights, whenever he takes the dominion, Minion, he shall break Jacob's yoke from off his neck. Every stitch of that was a curse because it's not until he's destroyed that the yoke is broken. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, the United States, Manasseh, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day, because the day of the Lord begins at the seventh trumpet, there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence the return of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet and not until then and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God every man's sword shall be against his brother was not Esau Jacob's brother but God hated Esau and he loved Jacob now if you're biologically from Esau and you became a Christian he's not angry at you he's talking to the communistic atheistic system here that's what's going to be destroyed and they're gonna know once and for all that God exists and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones that weigh about 180 pounds fire and brimstone thus will I magnify myself God says this is the point and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord they shall know that our Heavenly Father is God that he exists and as it's written every knee shall bow at that time all the tribes of the earth shall mourn it's at that time that they'll realize that they've been worshiping the devil that rider of the white horse in the first seal in Revelation chapter 6 the false Christ and then the Millennium begins the day of the Lord when discipline is taught and if they don't stand against Satan after the thousand years are finished they're blotted out in the lake of fire Everyone else goes into the eternity, the third world age. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, which means my messenger, or Malachiah, messenger of Yah. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Cursed to always live away from the fat of the land, as we know from Genesis chapter 27, Esau was, and to correctly translate it from the Hebrew, that's what it says, he was cursed to always live away from the fat of the land. Jacob received the blessings because God loved Jacob, because Jacob loved God, and he hated Esau because of what happened in the first world age. So what this boils down to, why these two are being brought up, as God said to Jacob and Esau's mother while they were still in the womb, they were twins that fought in their mother's womb, and their mother asked God, Why am I thus? And God responded, Two nations are in your womb. So we're not only talking about the two superpowers, the United States being Jacob, all 12 tribes, all Christian nations, Christianity really, and Russia being Esau or Edom, which means red, that red nation. These two are symbolic as leaders of the two different types of people that are in this world. It's really that simple. Either you're a Christian or you're not. And the whole book is really summed up in Malachi chapter 3 verse 18 where it says, Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God, Jacob that is to say, and him that serveth him not. Esau, that is to say. That's what these two symbolize. Who do you want to be like? Who's your role model? Jacob or Esau? Do you want to love God? Do you want God to love you and bless you? Or do you want to be like Esau and not care about your heritage? And that's why God hated Esau, because he didn't care about God. 
It all goes back to the First World Age and what happened there at Satan's Rebellion. Esau was obviously on Satan's side. Otherwise, why would God hate Esau and love Jacob? You have to understand that there are three world ages or you're not going to understand this book or any other book in our Father's Word. And when we speak of Russia, we're not talking about the Christians in Russia whenever we read of God hating Esau. We're talking about the communistic system, the anti-Christian system, that is to say. Verse 4, Whereas Edom saith, which means red, that red nation, we are impoverished, being cursed to live away from the fat of the land, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. The enemies of Christianity, that is to say. That's what you have going on in Daniel chapter 7, basically. The lion symbolic of the Christian nations, and the bear symbolic of the communistic and non-Christian nations. And the leopard is symbolic of the Kenites and their four hidden dynasties, the infrastructure of that one world system, with Daniel's fourth beast being the supernatural ingredient. It's strictly supernatural, and I think you'll find that's pretty obvious if you read the book of Daniel chapter 7 carefully. I think you'll find that to be the case. And here we have the border of wickedness. Remember the Berlin Wall that we mentioned in the book of Obadiah, which is also about Edom, and how they will be destroyed from being a nation at the seventh trumpet. That's what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That word chief is Rosh in the Hebrew. So you're talking about Russia. Again, not the Christians of Russia. Christianity really is a nation in and of itself. It's not a geographical location necessarily, and the same thing goes for the flip side of the coin, which is Satanism, really, because there's no in-between. By default, you're really a Satanist at the end of the day if you don't love our father, atheists and the atheistic communistic system that we're talking about here and remember that this book of malachi is addressed to israel now what is israel abraham's seed really isn't it and abraham's seed is christianity as we know from galatians chapter 3 if you be christ then you are abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise as it's written in the last verse of galatians chapter 3 that's ultimately what we're talking about here in this book of Malachi, that's what our Father is ultimately speaking of when you take it to the ultimate actuality. So again, thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build Edom, that is to say, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, the iron curtain, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Again, symbolic, but literal at the same time. That Berlin Wall being the dividing line between communism and Christianity. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And this looks forward to the end of that five-month-long hour of temptation whenever Ezekiel 38 and 39 transpires, the Battle of the Valley of Haman Gog. It happens on the border of Israel, an invasion by Esau, along with several others, the enemies of Christianity, and they're pelted with hailstones at that time, as you can read of in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and that's when Edom is destroyed from being a nation forever. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Again, Moscow and Tobolsk, the capitals of of Russia, that red nation, not the Christians of Russia, but the communistic atheistic system, the bear of Daniel chapter 7, not just Edom, which means red, and the world headquarters of communism is Red Square Moscow, but also the other anti-Christian nations, including Ishmael. Remember, Esau married one of the daughters of Ishmael after having married two Canaanite women. And the Canaanites were a mixture of Kenites and Geber, so there you have it. Meshach and Tubal being Moscow and Tobolsk, but why was it called Tobolsk in the first place? Remember, Tubal came from that 
that first batch of Kenites in Genesis chapter 4, with the Kenites in cooperation with Esau being the architects of communism and the Bolshevik revolution, which brought about the USSR. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field, to be devoured, the flesh bodies being done away with at that time, as we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. At the seventh trumpet, upon the return of the true Christ, all are changed into spiritual bodies, and as they're changing into spiritual bodies, they'll be pelted with those hailstones, weighing about 180 pounds apiece, and they're going to know that God exists. And you might wonder, how is it that they can still be communistic atheists, with the supernatural being evident during that five months, God having spoken through his election, and the two witnesses having prophesied during that last two and a half months of the five-month-long hour of temptation. But remember, the scribes and Pharisees witnessed Christ himself in his first advent, performing miracles, and still didn't believe upon him. You have that same mindset here, Esau not caring about his birthright, one iota, and again, he married two Canaanite women. So more than likely, you have Kenite DNA to take into consideration here, and Esau also married one of the daughters of Ishmael, which explains his alliance with the Islamic nations that we went over in the last chapter. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, not in a city, but in the open field. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and I will send a fire on Magog, on the land itself, Eurasia, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. Why would people be dwelling carelessly at this time? Because they think that Christ is here, because they're worshiping the false Christ, and they shall know that I am the Lord. They're going to know that it was the false Christ as soon as Christ returns, the true Christ, that is to say, at the seventh trumpet. Because whenever you change into a spiritual body, you remember everything going back to the first world age even. So will I make my holy name, Yahweh, known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Every knee shall bow and every eye shall see him upon the return of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet, with all flesh being done away with at that time. Satan's role of Antichrist will be destroyed by the brightness of the return of the true Christ and no more one world system ever again. As it's written in Daniel chapter 2, you see that stone that was cut without hands which smote the image upon his feet, that image that was symbolic of Satan's one world system, his feet that were of iron and clay, that's the mixture of the supernatural with the other three beasts, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. Satan's one world system destroyed at the seventh trumpet, as you can read of in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. What is summer? It's harvest time, the end of the world, the return of the true Christ. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone, the true Christ, the true rock, our sure foundation, that smote the image became a great mountain, a great nation, a great kingdom, and filled the whole earth. And then God, through Daniel, went on to describe it in further detail in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, those four beasts that you can read of in Daniel 7, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Our God is a consuming fire. And the empires written of in Daniel were only types of that one world system that's going to emerge at the woe of the fifth trumpet, receiving a deadly wound, and then it becomes a religious one world system, and then the true Christ will destroy it upon his return at the seventh trumpet. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel, once and for all. Behold! Behold! 
It is come and it is done. It is finished as Christ said on the cross and as it's written in Revelation 16 when that seventh vial is poured out. It is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken, the day of the Lord, the thousand years. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons Think spiritually here. We're in the millennium now. You have to go there in your mind to understand both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand stabs and the spears, that's six, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, and the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet. This word years, when you look into it, means ages or the end of the age, the millennium, that is to say, closing out this second world age, because at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be let loose from his prison for a short season, and whoever follows him after that is blotted out in the lake of fire, with with everyone else going into the eternity, the third world age, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. Remember in Daniel 7 that it's written that their dominion was taken away, those other three beasts, Daniel's fourth beast, the supernatural, will be destroyed upon the return of the true Christ at the seventh trumpet. But as you can read in Revelation chapter 11, those 7,000, seven being spiritual completeness, meaning the full number of the fallen angels are destroyed at the seventh trumpet. That's Daniel's fourth beast. All but Satan himself, who's locked up in the bottomless pit for the thousand years. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. Again, think spiritually as well as physically as far as this is concerned, and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. This is when the teaching of discipline transpires bringing those lost souls to the Father, whereby they can stand against Satan at the end of the thousand years and go into the eternity, because it's not God's will that any of his children perish. He cares about them. That's the whole point here. And again, seven means completion, and this word months, if you look that up, means renewal. This is the restoration, a time of salvation, which is why the true Christ returns at the beginning of the millennium in the office of Savior, and the full Godhead returns at the end end of the millennium for the great white throne judgment you can read of in Revelation chapter 20. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. He shall be glorified because of his perfect plan of salvation, and the millennium, the day of the Lord, is the opportunity for those that fell short to stand against Satan after the thousand years are finished. And they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth. This word passengers is interesting too. It means to pass over, not only passing into that other dimension, but when does that happen? Upon the return of the true Christ, the true Passover. You'll find that same Hebrew word in Daniel chapter 11 concerning the return of the true Christ. Passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it after the end of seven months, months being renewal, if you take it to the root, shall they search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And also, the name of the city shall be Hamona, which means to the multitude. Thus shall they cleanse the land cleansing the earth of those who choose not to love our Father. Because after that teaching of discipline, if they follow Satan again, after all that, after the thousand years are finished, then they'll be blotted out. And there's your cleansing of the earth. Blotted out of existence. They won't even be remembered. But that's not God's will that any should perish. He wants all of his children to return to him. Some won't. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, a Assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. 
Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan, all flesh being done away with. And you can also read of this in Revelation 19, where you have the Battle of Armageddon described there. Two separate battles that happen at the exact same time. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken, of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with horses and their riders, that is to say, we're talking about flesh being done away with, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn upon the return of the true Christ. They'll realize at that time that they've been deceived. But God so loved his children that not only did he come as the Savior himself in the first advent, he's coming back again as the Savior in the second advent at the seventh trumpet. And that's when this thousand years begins. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid upon them. So that the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. Because they trespassed against me, therefore hid I my face from them, and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness, and according to their transgressions, have I done unto them, and hid my face from them, in accordance with Deuteronomy 28. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, the natural seed as well as those grafted in, Christianity. In the third world age, it'll be nothing but Israel, because those who refuse to worship our Father and insist on following Satan will be blotted out of existence. Those who stand against Satan will be grafted onto the tree of life, God's family tree, Israel. If you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise? The promised land. What is that ultimately the third world age, the eternity. So again, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob. This is a captivity of love in a good way, not a captivity in the negative sense at all, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name, after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, that our Heavenly Father is King, and no one else, which calls them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. As it's written in Matthew chapter 24, at the seventh trumpet, immediately after the tribulation of Satan, Christ will say, Send forth his angels to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the fulfillment of the parable of the fig tree written of in Jeremiah 24 as well as several other places. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So the Battle of Armageddon happens at the same time as the Battle of the Valley of Hamangog in two different geographic locations. The Battle of Armageddon, over where Jerusalem is, basically, and the Battle of the Valley of Hamangog in the mountains of Israel, where the ten tribes migrated to eventually. They went north over the Caucasus Mountains after being taken into captivity by the Assyrian, went into Europe and then over to the Americas, and that's where the Battle of the Valley of Hamangog will take place, in Alaska to be specific. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and Satan is that prince of the power of the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven, 
from the throne saying, it is done. This is the return of the true Christ. And this vial is poured out into the air because this is when the return of the true Christ destroys Satan's role of Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. His role of Antichrist as well as his one world system are destroyed at that time as we'll read of in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. But Satan himself is locked up for the thousand years. The beast and the false prophet aren't two individuals. It's simply his role of Antichrist and his one world system, including his angels. Daniel's fourth beast are destroyed at that time. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, Babylon means confusion, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And this is the same point in time as in Daniel chapter 2, when you see that stone destroy the statue that's written of in Daniel chapter 2, which is symbolic of Satan's one world system. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and you can also read of this in the book of Ezekiel, in chapters 13 and 38 and 39, talking about both the battle of Armageddon as well as the battle of the valley of Hamangog with those hailstones. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great.